Hi everyone, welcome to Studio Sunday and happy Father's Day. We're actually filming this on Saturday because Terry's taking Father's Day off tomorrow, aren't you? Yeah. You're going to go see your father on Father's I Day. I am. I am. So, happy Father's Day to everybody that fathers. Happy Father's Day. Whether it's a child, a parent, a dog, a cat, a fish. <laughs> father fish. I never thought about that. Anyway, in the studio, we're all about Parker girls around here. It will go to the printer on the 27th, so you have until next Monday to subscribe to the 10 issue series. So um, keep that in mind. I think last week I said it was going to be tomorrow, but you're not ready for that. So, so we're going to extend that to the 27th, and it's going to go to the printer. And then you're going to go sign the variant covers right. over in San Antonio. And um, looking forward to that. Those will be shipped out, signed variants. Yeah. You know, you have a blue cover and a red cover, and I'm going to go sign them. They're red covers. That's the variant, the red cover. Okay, good to know. Because red is trouble. <laughs> okay, San Diego Comic Con is four weeks away and we're preparing for that as well. Three years is a long time between shows. I've forgotten how many moving parts <laughs> there are to get us there. Yeah, it's complicated. Yeah, just to say the least. So, um, so I'm all about that right now. Uh, we will have Parker Girls issue number one at the show as well as the 2022 sketchbook and the serial omnibus. So if you need to catch up, come by and see us. We're at booth 2109, our usual spot. That'll be three new things to get. Yeah. And I'm hoping maybe a couple surprises as well. Ah, good. We're going to give away a car, right? No. A boat? <laughs> no. Maybe a sketch. No, we're not even giving away a sketch. <laughs> Come by and get a handshake. Yes. I'm also it's working fun. on getting the digital Parker Girls uh, issues up on the website. So we should have it, uh, those available the day the comic is released. So if the comic comes out on August 3rd in print, it will also be available digitally that day. And it's available. it should be up on our site. Keep your fingers crossed that I can get that taken care of. That's all I've got. I like that, that it hits the stands and the iPads on the same day. Absolutely. So. Do you have anything to add, Mr. Moore? Uh, I can tell the answer is no. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm good. I'm just, I've just been right here, right where you left me. So, nothing new. So. Okay, so let's get on the hot seat. All right. Let's do it. The first question is from your friend Todd Ferguson. He keeps you on his toes. Yes, he on does. your toes, doesn't he? Yeah, Todd's paying attention. Okay, listen carefully to this. Okay. When is it time to put it to bed? Speaking of covers, or go in and make the change. My case in point, the cover to serial number eight originally showed Zoe coming in for the kill with Mamali standing off to the side, the angel of death like. It went from pencil refs to finished pencils, inked, and then colored. But then before printing, a decision was made to remove my Molly and Jenny, as well as switch out the weapons in Zoe's hand. What made for that change? Um, that, wow, Todd, I mean, seriously, that is really paying attention. <laughs> attention. Um, that was a cover that I, you know, I have to do these covers, uh, of, Quite a few months in advance to get them into the diamond catalog for solicitation. That's about five months in advance. So I it's not five months. Nine months. In, <laughs> it's a year and a half in advance that I have to do a cover. Um, it's a long time ahead. Ahead. Anyway, I what I did was I kind of come up with a vague idea of where I think they're going to be in that issue and. It's time to do something dramatic for that particular chapter, chapter eight. And um, so that's what I imagined. By the time I get there, it's different, of course. I've changed it. And one of the things that drew a red flag was having Mamale, who is my uh, catalog's angel of death, uh, literally, it, having her on the cover, bringing her into this series, we had kind of an editorial meeting about it, thinking like, do you really want to, you know, bring that into the series? The series is doing fine by itself. Do you want to bring Rachel Rising characters, more Rachel into it? At first I thought, yeah. But then I thought, you know what? 
It is complicating things because if you haven't read Rachel, who's this Lady Mamale and why are we suddenly suddenly getting surreal when everything has been so grounded, you know, if you can accept the fact that we have a 10 year old driving a um, microbus all over the place, why would you bring in an angel, you know? So we decided, okay, no Mamale, simplify it, just focus on Zoe. And um, I, we, I, I made the changes and I think I Why did you wait so cover. late? Why did you wait so late to do it? Um, because I, I think it was taking that long for me to see the story move in a different direction. And then when you read the story, you said, you know, why is Mamali on the cover? You didn't have her in the story, all that. So it just didn't fit anymore. Something that I had done three months ago no longer fit the, the slot. So that's a that's a matter of having to draw covers far in advance of when you actually make the issue. Well, most people plan. Yes, have their story plotted out so they know I can draw Francine in a on a bicycle because she's going to be on a bicycle in that issue. Planning and plotting. I I don't use the p word. <laughs> no, you I don't, don't work that way. <laughs> I, I work more organic, so that oh, organic. in my head I have a rough oh, idea. Got like, it. Okay, by issue eight, I know at least we're going to get like this this general idea. Specifics, I don't know okay. until I get there. Okay, well, I hope that answers Todd's question. I hope it answers your question, Todd. As you can tell, there was a lot of backstory to it. Um, you know, it was quite the drama in here in the studio. Okay. Your second question is from Erica Murphy. Hi, Erica. Also, let's see. Um, okay, what well, if Terry had had better, if Terry had had better luck with cartooning, mm -hmm. would could you and Francine's story still be told? No, I have to say no. It would have been more of a. Uh, it would have been a lot more um, uh, suppressed. For a comic strip, yeah. right? Uh, I would never have been able to tell you know the true story. Um, well, they, the story kind of evolved anyway. It did, but uh, so would I have done so in the comic strip. But comic strips have a, a different rule, you know. You, it's it's a general audience, and you work differently. When I got to indie comics, I felt free. You know, I could uh, be more truthful about what people said and did. Um, so yeah. Doing a comic strip is like putting on a skit at a school play. You have to work for that audience. Everybody's parents is in the audience and kids and all that, so it's different. But I did have Francine and Cachou existing as uh, comic book comic strip characters ahead of time. I eventually would have figured something out uh, where it was always kind of cute, but never resolved, like a sitcom romance, you know. Okay. Which, yeah, that could have been good, too. Yeah. We might have made it work. We'll never know. They would have found their way. They would have found their way. Erica, you know, you just can't stop it. That's they, right. They were two trains getting to their destination. That's right. Okay, well, that's it for me. Hope everyone has a wonderful week, and I'll see you right back here next week. Stay cool. It's a beast out there. Yeah. What are you drawing today? I have four key elements that I, I use in my books that I firmly believe make for a good story and make the audience care about your story. So I'm going to share those with you today. You're going to give away all your secrets? I am going to give away four of my secrets. Wow. Which Everybody is, listen up. It's a lot. I only have five secrets and here are four of them. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, meet me here at the drawing table and I'll tell you. When I was starting my comic, uh, Strangers in Paradise, I had two things that I was really interested in. One was I really wanted to just make a comic book for the first time, uh, an entire issue, and then maybe try to get, make another one. But I also wanted to be sure that I made a comic book that people would care about because I really wanted to have something that was my goal was I could keep going with the story. And the only way to do that is if people care and they're reading, they're reading the story, they're buying the book, uh, they're waiting for the next issue. Um, that's the dream come true, right? So um, over the years, as I was working on my 
stories and making my books, I kind of boiled it down to like four basic things that kept working for me. Um, so that's what I want to talk to you about today is uh, if you're making comic books or making comic book stories or just making stories in general, um, there are four key elements that I use uh, in all my books and I'm going to share them with you. Number one, um, the more you know, the more you care. Um, so you need to let the reader become invested in the character to really know them. Um, if it's just somebody uh, standing at the bus stop every day, uh, then you may wonder what they're like, but you don't know. Uh, versus if you, in the story, can see that person in their private environment, uh, at home, uh, in their apartment, um, what do they eat, what do they like, what do they read, you know, those little details let you get to know somebody and start making connections with them. If you feel very strongly about three things and this character has those three things that they agree with you on, you kind of make a connection with the character, believe it or not. Um, things, little things like that that matter. Um, also, it, it helps your heart get invested in the character. I'll give you a good example. Um, this is one that I've done on panels at, at comic conventions, but suppose um, I tell you that the story is going to be about a little boy who uh, his mom gives him a sack lunch and sends him off to school. He's like fifth grade and waves by and he turns the corner and a, a few bullies that are his age uh, make fun of him, grab the bag, throw it in the ditch. And, and walk away laughing. And the boy fights back tears, goes to school, doesn't have lunch that day. Um, okay, I have your attention and you care maybe that much. Okay, what if I give you more detail? What if I tell you that the boy's mother um, has stage four ovarian cancer and she's only got a, a little while left and she uses what strength she has to get up in the morning to make this kid his uh, lunch and put a note in there that says, I love you. Um, and she wraps it up, gives it to him and at the door, makes sure that he's all set for the day and watches him walk away, not knowing what kind of man he will grow up to become. And she thinks about him all day long. When lunchtime comes, she pictures him at school, eating the lunch, reading the note, feeling her love. And she hopes he will carry that with him always. Um, but that didn't happen today. Um, the lunch she made is sitting in a ditch and the boy is now confronted with how cruel the world can be. Now, how much do you care about the boy and the mother? Got it? Okay, moving on. Um, number two, only like 1% of the population <laughs> uh, can relate to supermodels, you know, or, and that may be who walks down the runway, who's on the magazine, or, or just Instagram influencers who spray, spray brush their uh, makeup on, uh, you know, the before and after stuff. Most people relate to the people next door. Um, and so when you're doing your story, if you want to have this unrealistic supermodel looking thing going on, I hope there's a reason for it. Did they, did they come from the planet of the gods? <laughs> uh, please don't tell me that a, a, an Instagram influencer got superpowers. <laughs> that would be weird. Although that might be a funny story. But I mean, if you're gonna draw any other kind of, you know, normal story in any of the genres, Spend a moment to think about how much you had a crush on somebody at school that, uh, you know, wasn't a supermodel. They were just neat. You just liked them. And they had a friendly face or a cute face. Not the ultimate Vogue magazine face, just cute. Um, this is what I was thinking of when I made my characters in Strangers in Paradise and the other books as well. But for instance, Francine uh, in Strangers in Paradise, um, Francine Peters is the girl next door. She was the teenager you would use to babysit your kids. Uh, reliable, cute, 
um, and she struggles with all kinds of personal body issues and her looks very insecure and all that. Um, she's not, you know, uh, starving herself to be fitting in size two clothes and things like that. So she's a normal person that you would meet at lunch, you know, let's go to lunch. And there's Francine sitting at the table next to us. That's the kind of person you get a crush on, uh, you know, when you're young and single and looking for a mate. That's the kind of person you're interested in. Write about that person. You know, if it's a supermodel in a thong, uh, okay, well, that's nice, but, you know, um, that's not who makes your heart, you know, flip. Okay, number three, um, every plot has been done. Don't even worry about it anymore. You don't need to come up with a new plot. You can take all the standard tropes and put them together for a new uh, super trope. <laughs> a lot of people do that. Uh, whatever, don't worry about it. it just pick, pick the setup that you like. It's all been done since the ancient Greeks. Um, every story plot has been quantified and taught in college writing classes. Kurt Vonnegut has a very funny video on YouTube about from his uh, college class about outlining the basic, there's, he, I think he says like seven or eight basic plots and he strings them out and shows you how it works. Uh, very funny. Um, the Joseph Campbell hero journey is, is, you know, the trope that everyone uses for action movies and reluctant heroes and quests and all that stuff like that, you know. Um, and just in those buzzwords, I probably hit one of your favorite stories. It's not that somebody came up with the very first reluctant hero. It's what the character does about the opportunity, right? That's your story. Human beings keep doing the same thing over and over and over. Um, what is interesting about each new generation or each new person is what you do about it, what your character does about it. Um, say you're in a car stuck on a train, a train track and the train is coming. Um, uh, what are you going to do about it? You can get out of the car and, and and get to safety, or you can keep working on the car to get it going, back forward, whatever. Um, so that's your trope. And you as the writer may infuse new factors like, oh, there's uh, 12 babies in, in baby seats in the back seat. <laughs> so getting out and running is not a good option. Uh, you really need to get the car going. The car's out of gas and you only have one tire left because you just were in a car chase with some bad guys. See what I mean? You just start adding new elements into the trope. It's not about car stuck on the train track anymore. It's about way more than that. It's the, the hero has a decision to make about lives at stake, uh, how to do it, whatever the resources. Now we're paying attention because we want to know what we would do about it and what you what your guy does about it. It's like watching somebody get out of a safe room. A safe room is a trope. How you get out of it is not. <laughs> Remember that. Number four, desire. Um, it's not the same as a quest or a wanting power or uh, a ring or world peace. <clears throat> I'm talking about desire for another person. And that doesn't fit into every single story, but there needs to be somebody that cares about somebody, <laughs> right? Unless you're writing The Martian. Uh, but even that guy, we all cared about him, his crew cared about him, there was desire to get him back or something, uh, save him. But I'm actually thinking more specific, like between two people. Um, in all my stories, I have a desire between two people. And the story, hopefully uh, uh, develops that so that you wonder, are these two going to get together? And it, it's, it's amazing how compelling that question can be. I'll give you an example. There was a manga book that I was addicted to right before I started Strangers in Paradise called Sanctuary. Um, and I was following this artist, um, Ikigami. He had done Crying Freeman, My the Psychic Girl, and now he was doing this book, Sanctuary. He's done a lot. Uh, this book was huge, of course, um, in Japan. So Dark Horse was reprinting them in these little digests, you know, manga digests that we get. And there was, the story was about two brothers who survived the Cambodian War and then rose in, uh, to power in Japan, one through politics and one through 
uh, the crime world, the criminal world, you know, Yakuza. And they, took, they stayed in touch with each other and passed information back and forth to help them leapfrog their uh, obstacles. Well, that's fine. You know, I'm only so interested in two men rising to power. Um, but what got me was there was a police chief, uh, a lady who was investigating all this. And the closer, more contact she came into with both of those brothers individually, the more there developed a sexual tension, <clears throat> a real desire um, between a woman of power and a man of power. They had things in common. The guys tried to be tough and above it all, the, but they, their armor was not able to withstand uh, this interesting woman. And the woman wasn't having anything to do with any of that kind of crap until she met the right guy. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just, it was just so compelling. I mean, it was really well done. And I spent $80 trying to find out if a comic book character uh, slept with another comic book character. <laughs> That's desire. Uh, it, it, it was something that stuck with me so that it's, um, uh, it's the uh, question that endures, not the answer. So by putting it off in the series and delay, 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 it became kind of uh, uh, one of those things, will they, won't they? And I was hooked. <laughs> so I used it to uh, as much effect as I could in my own stories. Um, I encourage you to think about including uh, real human desire in your book and your stories. Um, you can... Um, tap into whatever phase of your life that happened to you, or if you're fortunate, it's happening to you right now. But I guarantee you a lot of your readers are going through it. And to see it play out on the pages of your story in some form or fashion uh, is gonna be very compelling to your reader. A lot more compelling than uh, we need to go find a chalice or a sword, or you need to rob a bank. Um, you know what, we rob banks every day. But whether or not that police chief is going to sleep with that guy is something that I will finish that entire article trying to read that to find out if they do that. I don't care if you rob the bank. I don't care if you go get the chalice. I don't care if you get the sword. I do care if that police chief sleeps with that Yakuza guy. <laughs> get my drift? Okay, so uh, desire. Okay, so let's recap real quick. Number one, uh, the more you know, the more you care, right? No doubt about it. That's just how human beings work. Number two, uh, write about the people in normal life, the people next door. Um, we all, uh, that's who we know, that's who we relate to. Uh, only 1% of the population cares or relates to super, super people, supermodels. Um, so you're, you're writing to a very small uh, group. Number three, um, every plot has been done, every basic plot has been done. Uh, what matters is what your character does about it. Number four, desire. Uh, desire is what makes us get up on Monday morning. And don't forget it, it's an, it's an incredibly powerful motivator in a story. So that's it. Those are the four elements that I've used for all of my books. And uh, it got me here so, <laughs> to YouTube. <laughs> so uh, think about it when you're writing your stories and making your books, and I hope this has helped. Um, next week I'll get back to the drawing board, but I want to point out that when I'm drawing, I do want to try to draw something that people care about, and I have those four things in my mind. It's worked for me. I hope it works for you. Those are my four secrets. I only have one more left, and I'm not going to tell it to you. <laughs> Bye. See you next week.